So as an immigrant, as a refugee, as someone who was for decades considered an undocumented immigrant, what racist likes to call an illegal immigrant, um, one of the things I constantly heard is um, I need to pull myself up by bootstraps, I sh- or I should go back to wherever I came from. But here's the thing. Because of gunboat diplomacy, um, because of the establishment of banana republics by which to profit U.S. corporations, in the last century, um, every country along the Caribbean, including my own country, was invaded, that's Marines, boots on the ground, um, at least 21 times for the express purpose of overthrowing the political structures so you could implement structures that were, um, that, that were beneficial um, and, 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 and compatible with U.S. business interests. And that doesn't include the 26 times that, um, that, that the CIA was involved in overthrowing governments. So that's 27, I'm sorry, that's um, 47 regime changes during the last century. That's once every two years. So when you ask me, why did I come to this country? I didn't come looking for freedom and I didn't come looking for the American dream. I literally came following everything that was stolen from my own country. So the issue really is not um, that, that somehow, um, I, you know, that, that this country is being so generous by accepting me. The issue is really I'm following all that was stolen from me. And, and, and literally what made this country so, such a great empire, such a, such a powerhouse economically, is my stolen labor and my, the stolen um, resources of my own country. So it's much more complicated than simply pull yourself up by your bootstraps. There's a history of, of, of this nation being built on the sweat of another person's brow and on the strength of another person's arm. Hope you feel With every graveyard flower Welcome to the Deconstructionist Podcast. I am your host, John Williamson, and we're back this week with a very cool episode. Uh, Those of you who have been listening longer than five minutes know that I am a huge history nerd, and I love history, and I love digging into things and um, kind of understanding where we came from and how we got to where we are today. Uh, And so this episode is super fun for me. Uh, This week, we have Dr. Miguel A. De La Torre. Uh, He is an author, professor, speaker, uh, I got my hands on an older book uh, that he released years ago called The Politics of Jesus, a Hispanic uh, Political Theology. Uh, and so when his new book came out, uh, he has a new book called Decolonizing Christianity, Becoming Badass Believers. Um, I was really excited to read it. And it's easily one of my favorite books I've read uh, so far this year. Uh, really does a fantastic job of really kind of digging into the question that I know I personally have had for a long time that I wrestle with. Uh, Because any of you out there who are listening, who are listening from the United States, know that despite the fact that we say we have a multi party political system, it's really two parties, right? So uh, we've got the Democrats and the Republicans. And uh, um, not to talk too much about politics, because I know that's a it's a taboo subject, but you you can't not talk about politics when talking about specifically white evangelical Christianity. Uh, Because anybody who's been paying attention knows that specifically white evangelical Christianity is is very uh, kind of infused into politics uh, in America. And so specifically, if we're if we're if we're really being specific here, uh, we're we're talking about one particular party. So um, the Republican Party, you know, and and what we would consider more conservative uh, um, Christianity. And so. Um, and it's, it's very heavily weighted on that side. So anybody who's lived here and is, and is even semi-aware of politics in this country knows that, 
um, it, it's been that way for quite some time, right? So if you consider yourself uh, to be, um, you know, for lack of a better word, conservative Christian, then typically your political leanings are Republican. And so um, it is curious. It's very interesting. As I, you know, I've gotten older, I'm now in my early 40s. You know, I, I voted ever since I was uh, legally able to. And, um, you know, obviously, as I got more invested in politics, I started to wonder, why, why is that? How did that come to be, you know? Because uh, so oftentimes those people are the first ones to say, well, separation of church and state. And yet uh, the two are so infused together. Uh, it, it's undeniable. And so how did that happen? Well, in this book, um, Professor De La Torre talks about kind of the history and dives into the history of it. And it's been a long journey to get to where we are today. And it's, it's fascinating. So for those of you who have, who have wondered how that came to be, I highly recommend the new book. Um, and, and I think you'll find this, this conversation enlightening. So um, it's definitely, you know, it's going to be tougher to hear for those of us who are, you know, white Christians and, and, you know, it's always tough to hear a critique, um, of the thing that we're a part of, uh, no doubt. And so, um, but until we can have honest conversations, um, uh, without reacting, um, I, I, I don't think anything, uh, can possibly improve or get better. So, uh, so buckle up. This is a fun conversation. Um, I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I enjoyed talking to him. I learned a ton. So, uh, with that, the musical guest this week is Sam Birchfield. Uh, so appreciative as always, uh, for Sam letting us use some of his music for this episode. Please go out and support him. Uh, if you can, if you like his tunes, uh, as always, we will update our Spotify playlist. Uh, with uh, one of his tracks. And so you can go back and listen to all the other previous artists that we've used throughout the long and storied history of the Deconstructionist podcast. By the way, it was weird. The other day I was thinking about this. We've been at it for five years now, and there's a ton lately of like new podcasts and social media influencers uh, that are really into the deconstruction thing. And um, it's weird feeling like the OG now, you know, like (laughs) we've been around for a while. It's weird. Anyway, um, so yeah. So uh, if you want to check out what we're up to, though, link to us on social media, send us an email um, or some hate mail, whatever. Uh, www.thedeconstructionist.com is our website where you can find all that good stuff. Uh, You can read our blog. Uh, You can uh, join our Patreon family if you want to support us in that way. We've got some cool packages on there. Um, If you just want to support us in the easiest way possible, uh, tell a friend. Uh, and leave us a five-star review on iTunes. That's a really easy way for us to get exposure. Um, and, and we're really proud of the fact that our podcast has, uh, has grown over the years just by word of mouth. So thank you guys so much for your support. Really appreciate it. We've got some really cool episodes coming uh, in the coming weeks here. So um, can't wait to release those. And um, I think that's it, guys. I'll shut up now. So without further ado, I give you Dr. Miguel... A de la Torre. Okay, welcome to the Deconstructionist Podcast. I'm very, very excited to have uh, the guest on this week. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Miguel A. de la Torre. My pleasure to be here. And and do you guys go by Dr. Latore? Yes, I do. Okay, perfect. All right. So, um, again, I think I told you before we started recording, uh, I, I got an advanced copy of your book and started to dig into it and just um, thoroughly enjoy it. It's just a, an incredible book. Um, for me, as a, as a, uh, as a white man, um, it, it was very informative, uh, very educational. Um, I can't highly recommend it enough, so I'm, I'm really excited to dig into it. Um, this is a follow-up, though, to a prior book you wrote. Is that, is that correct? That is correct. I wrote an earlier book a few years ago called, called Burying White Privilege, Resurrecting a Badass Christianity. And um, based on some of the critiques I received in the book, first book, um, it led me to write this particular book. Okay. So 
one of the interesting things uh, that I thought the, the very beginning uh, that that kind of um, uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on. So you talk about there's a, there's a couple quotes that kind of flow together. I think uh, one of the quotes, one of the things you say at the very beginning of the book is, rather than dealing with their complicity, uh, these whites are demanding that the sufferers provide the means to resolve their own suffering. And then you go on to say. Uh, regardless of how many times the marginalized have come forward to reason in good faith, they have been met with refusal to listen. So is one of the th- first steps, I think, for, for white people who, who want to be helpful um, in, in the effort to, to bring about equality is just to stop talking and just listen? Definitely, that's one of the th- uh, first steps, um, to listen. And, of course, the second step is to do something. Um, I mentioned that I wrote this book as a response to some of the critique of the first book. And one of the major critiques was that I provided a good description as to what's wrong, but I didn't provide any solutions. So that's what led to these particular two quotes. Uh, It's as though you're asking the abused spouse to come up with the solutions to stop their abuse. So what I'm trying to say is, number one, It's up to those who are benefiting from the oppressive structures to come up with the solutions, and they can only do that if they actually listen to those with whom they are abusing and are benefiting from. Yeah, and you and you make it clear at the beginning too. I thought this was really important um, in the introduction to the book. You you make it clear who the book is written for. Who who, in your opinion, is is this book written for? Yeah. Basically, I didn't really want it to be written to a white audience because uh, to do so, I would have to then jump through all types of hoops to try to put them at ease. Instead, I was writing to other communities of color who have so for so long um, been w- looking at reality through the lens, through the eyes of a dominant culture that they are unaware of of how they are constructing a worldview in which makes them complicit with their own oppression. So so the idea of the book was to raise the consciousness of communities of color that are being oppressed to encourage them to look and define reality using their own symbols and through their own culture. And if white people listen into that conversation, well, they're more than welcome to do so. But they were not my intended audience. And and let me just be very clear right off the bat. When I say white, I'm not talking about skin pigmentation. I am talking about a worldview that centers power and privilege and profit on white supremacy and the maintaining of white supremacy. And as we know, there are people of color who for all practical purposes are ontologically white. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's funny that you say that because that was literally my next question is um, how, because you, you do define white Christianity specifically in the book. Um, so I'll skip to the next question. Um, <laughs> so you talk about this famous phrase in the book uh, that, that you're not a huge fan of it, uh, and it's speaking truth to power. Explain, explain that. When people say that we need to speak truth to power, it assumes that power is unaware of truth. And, and I would argue that power is well aware of what is true and what is right and what is wrong. Looking at the previous um, administration, presidential administration, um, they knew what they were doing. They knew exactly what they were doing. When current legislators are trying to pass laws, over 260 bills, that would go ahead and disenfranchise black and brown voters by passing um, voting suppression, suppression bills, they know what they're doing. You know, to tell them that they do, you know, that that, that there's no such thing as um, the fraud that they keep voting for, that they keep insisting, they already know that. So the issue is not to tell those in power what they already know to be true. Um, It's really to talk to those who are outside of power, who have adopted the worldview of a dominant culture that reinforces 
maintain and sustain their own oppression. So it is to the powerless that I really want to talk truth to. Oh, that's so good. One of the other things that I love how you define it in the book is, is you really dig into just the word racism itself. And so you define racism, you make the point that racism is not a belief, but complicity with an ideology. And that's such a huge distinction. I wondered if you could unpack that a little. Of course. I mean, many white people would say, well, I'm not racist. I mean, I don't use the N word and I don't believe in burning crosses. And, you know, I don't believe that uh, people of color should be paid less than white people. And, and, and they think that because they hold these beliefs that they are not racist. But it's not an issue of what one believes. It's not an issue of bias. It's not an issue of prejudice. It's an issue of being complicit with structures of oppression. So, so let me flip the switch here. For, I mean, flip the script here for a moment. I am male. I am a cisgendered male man. Um, I am a sexist. And I say that because it doesn't matter that I believe in women's rights. It doesn't matter that I'm a flaming feminist. It doesn't matter that I may wear a pink hat and protest uh, for women's rights. At the end of the day, I am going to be privileged economically, being paid more than a woman, simply because I occupy a male body. Hence, I am complicit with sexism, I am a sexist. Now, I could say I'm a recovering sexist. I'm trying not to be complicit with sexism. But after many decades of life, how can I not be complicit with sexism? And and the beauty of occupying a male body is that at any given time, I could always fall off the wagon and not speak truth when sexist and patriarchal and misogynist things are occurring. In the same way, all of your white listeners are racist. It doesn't matter if they believe in equal rights or if they marched during the uh, Black Lives Matter or if they're at the border protesting the incarceration of brown children. They, the society is designed to privilege them simply because of skin pigmentation. Now, they could be recovering racists, and that's fantastic. But we should never lose sight of how we are complicit with structures of oppression that are designed to privilege us even when we don't want those structures to privilege us. Push me in the river Lies on the other side Carried by the water Never be the same Here I am calling out my name Wow, and w- one of the things that I think you do so well in the book as, as a... Uh, person with a background in history, uh, I, I love personally, is you really dig into the history uh, of a lot of the aspects of, of what we're dealing with as a country right now. One of them is you talk about the fact that, you know, there's this false notion, this false idea, uh, especially from white people in this country that, you know, that we all kind of pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps and we worked hard for, for what we have. And, and you point out, uh, rightly so, that no, this, this country is founded on stolen land and genocide and, and free labor, you know? And, and so, uh, talk about like kind of this, this false notion that has kind of perpetuated throughout the history of, of, uh, of America. Well, well you, you mentioned two of those um, items, the um, stolen land and the, uh, of indigenous people and, of course, the stolen labor of um, African people. But let me give you another example and, and tie it into the issue of immigration for a moment. So as an immigrant, as a refugee, as someone who was for decades considered an undocumented immigrant, what racists likes to call an illegal immigrant, um, one of the things I constantly heard is um, I need to pull myself up by bootstraps. I sh- oh, I should go back to where I came from. But here's the thing. Because of gunboat diplomacy, 
um, because of the establishment of banana republics by which to profit U.S. corporations, in the last century, um, every country along the Caribbean, including my own country, was invaded, that's Marines, boots on the ground, um, at least 21 times for the express purpose of overthrowing the political structures so you could implement structures that were, um, that, that were beneficial um, and, 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 and compatible with U.S. business interests. And that doesn't include the 26 times that, um, that, that the CIA was involved in overthrowing governments. So that's 27, I'm sorry, that's um, 47 regime changes during the last century. That's once every two years. So when you ask me why did I come to this country, I didn't come looking for freedom and I didn't come looking for the American dream. I literally came following everything that was stolen from my own country. So the issue really is not um, that, that somehow um, I, you know, that, that this country is being so generous by accepting me. The issue is really I'm following all that was stolen from me. And, and, and literally what made this country so, such a great empire, such a, such a powerhouse economically is my stolen labor and my, the stolen um, resources of my own country. So it's much more complicated than simply pull yourself up by your bootstraps. There's a history of, of, of this nation being built on the sweat of another person's brow and on the strength of another person's arm. So, so in a way, um, we shouldn't be surprised that when we build roads into other countries to steal the raw materials and their cheap labor, that those individuals, myself included, follow those same roads, uh, take those same roads, following everything that has been stolen from us. Hmm. One of the other things, too, that, that you do a great job of addressing is the fact that, um, and we've, we've talked about this on the podcast before, is just the fact that it's so baked into the system itself here, uh, the fact that, that white supremacy uh, you know, is so baked and tied to the system uh, to the point where, whether you like it or not, as a white person in the United States, you are set up in such a way to succeed and to have advantages. And you point this out. You have this great quote in the book where you talk about, um, see if I can find it here, uh, rather than issuing a clearing clarion herald for justice euro american churches all too often are cults perpetuating whiteness by embracing a white god a white jesus a white liturgy white biblical hermeneutics and a white theology reinforcing centuries of white supremacy and the fact that like not only is it tied into the political structure but it's supported uh in essence by you know by these churches in america absolutely absolutely i mean when we, you know, one, one of my um, dear uh, friends um, who passed away a few years ago, James Cone, used to say that if white Christianity has nothing to say about Jim Crow or slavery, then it is satanic. In the same way, I'm, I'm building on him, and I would argue that if today white churches, white Christianity has nothing to say about children in cages— or has nothing to say about police officers placing the, the, the knees on the neck of African Americans, um, then that Christianity continues to be satanic. And that's on the political level. But on, you know, and, and, and as we've seen with COVID in this past year, those more, more, you know, more likely to die um, were black and brown people. You know, and, and it's not a coincidence. It's because the structures are designed in such a way to privilege whiteness with access to health that is denied communities of color. Um, and once we do have a vaccine, we find um, you know, the, the latest newspaper reports that, again, black and brown people are not getting their share of those vaccines that it's mostly going to white Americans. 
So it is so structural that we don't even realize how common it has become, except those of us who are of color who have higher death rates uh, and shorter lifespans. Wow. <clears throat> One of the things that you also uh, talk about that I thought was so um, uh it just just really hit me like a ton of bricks was you, you talk about and, and you liken it um, to um, uh, Jesus uh, in the, in the desert being offered these temptations by Satan. Uh, and you talk about um, you, you compare uh, all these things that Jesus has offered uh, like profit and privilege and power uh, being the exact things that while he's denying them, those seem to be the three things that, uh, primarily, white Christians are so uh, consumed with uh, presently, it seems. Yes, I, I find the story of the temptation of the desert um, to be so um, appropriate for what white churches um, are experiencing today, in where Jesus was, you know, told um, turn this bread into uh, turn these stones into bread. He was, you know, tempted with possessions, or you know. You go on top of the uh, temple and throw yourself off and the angels will catch you because of who you are. He was tempted with privilege and um, bow down before me and I'll give you all these kingdoms. He was tempted with power. And, and, and today, we, you know, our, our, not just white churches, but all of us continue to be tempted with those same things. So it is up to the church to become the voice that leads us away from these temptations. And the only way that it can be done, in my opinion, is by entering into radical solidarity with the least of these. Um, because as long as we hold on to those um, unearned power, privilege, and profit, um, we continue to be part of a religious system that has more to do with the tempter in the desert than the one that was being tempted. One of the things that, that you talk about in the book, and, and I know uh, a lot of people out there are probably like, Trump is no longer president. Can we just forget he ever existed? But one of the things that you point out in the book is that, you know, just because he's no longer in office does not mean that there isn't this residual effect uh, that will continue or could potentially continue to be an issue. And um, one of the things that you mentioned is that this current kind of uh, Trump version of, of Christianity that, that we see, or this kind of uh, draw, uh, you know, to Trump uh, by a certain subset of, of Christians anyway, uh, can be traced all the way back to the 1940s. And you talk about how uh, really from the start of the prosperity gospel through uh, the decades, we were just kind of primed for, for this sort of thing to happen. Talk about that a little bit. Of course. I think we make a tremendous mistake to think that the Trump phenomenon is, um, you know, just this, this weird thing that happened in this country. And quite frankly, I think Biden is wrong when he keeps saying this is not who America is. Um, I would argue that Trump is exactly who America is. Um, and the rise of Trump um, really occurred back in the 1940s. Um, the Depression was ending. Uh, corporate America uh, was feeling the sting of the New Deal. And, and they wanted to try to, um, you know, uh, fight against this liberal legislation of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And, and there was a minister by the name of Fifield who basically gave a speech to these capitalists. Um, and, you know, I'm talking about the major titans of industry in where he argued that what they need is for the churches to preach the good news of capitalism as the salvation of America. And then you had um, individuals like the Pew Brothers who, you know, were oiled, um, own oil companies. Um, and, and they went ahead and not only bankrolled uh, Fifield, they also bankrolled an unknown um, tent revivalist by the name of Billy Graham. 
And, and what you begin to develop is this Christianity that is totally against all types of social justice issues, whether it be um, you know, the, the New Deal or the Great Society or the New Frontier or the Civil Rights Movement, which Billy Graham was against, um, arguing that only when Jesus returned can we ever have racial harmony. Um, the, you know, and, and then you have Nixon with the whole Southern strategy, uh, which Billy Graham was part of as well, um, that, that began to use race as a way of division. Um, and, and, and the book goes into a lot of the history of this. So by the time that you get to a Trump, uh, while before we were using uh, coded language, you know, things like, you know, welfare queen, as, as Reagan made very popular, you know, we all knew that he was talking about black women, but he kept saying welfare queens living off of, well, you know, um, taking them, getting you know, milking the system. Now you have a Trump that did away with the code of language and just said, you know, Mexicans are rapists and they have lots of problem and, and, you know, they're, they're bringing drugs. <laughs> so, so we, we, we've literally, um, on, you know, what Trump did is that he removed the mask of political correctness. And, and what's so sad is that on election night, we were hoping to see a, a total um, uh, break with this type of racism. And yet the strongest block to vote for Trump in this last election and in 2016 were not just white evangelicals, although they were the highest numbers, um, but also white Protestants and white Mormons and white Catholics. So what this tells me is that this white Christianity literally is based on political policies that are detrimental, if not deadly, to communities of color for our own livelihood, for our own salvation, we must reject this white Christianity. And if white people ever wish to get saved, they too must reject this white Christianity. Oh, man. And that's one of the things that I think that has uh, driven me crazy uh, over the last uh, handful of years is this idea that, and you pointed out in the book, uh, trying trying to answer this question of like how could uh, folks who uh, say and profess to follow Jesus of the Bible who is you know the the, the person who's standing uh, standing up for the marginalized and the people who who don't have a voice for themselves and yet uh, seem to be doing the opposite you know and, and you mentioned in the book uh, you know ripping families apart at the border and putting uh, children in cages and and all of these things that seem to be completely antithetical to the New Testament entirely. Well, it just seems like there's a massive disconnect there. There is. And, and, and the only way you could explain it is that whatever this Christianity that not only justifies, but supports this type of behavior that is tearing family apart that is literally um, destroying these little children. And I say destroying because the psychological damage of being whipped by your parents and thrown in the cage is going to come and haunt us in, in 10, 20, 30 years. Um, something about it's better to have a, 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 a millstone wrapped around your neck and thrown into the ocean, I think is what Jesus said. Um, to, to say that somehow I could justify this through my faith, I have to go back to James Cone. That faith is satanic. It brings death. And, 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 and if Jesus is the Jesus of life, then anything that brings death is counter to the very essence of what we say Christianity is. I was born in the river, was born again, and this water's the reason that my 
One of the things you point out in the book too, and and I'll admit I I did not know this. Uh, you know, I was a pretty young child in the in the eighties, so I wasn't wasn't quite as aware uh, of what was going on in, in what would have been the Reagan era. But uh, th- this campaign slogan that 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 Trump used during his campaign, "Make America Great Again," uh, is not new. Uh, in fact, it was used during the Reagan era. And you dive into the history there. Uh, you talk about the fact that. I believe it was Reagan's, uh, and then later Bush seniors. Uh, one of uh, one of the folks who worked for him uh, admitted, essentially, in an interview that they would they were using very racist tactics to to sway votes uh, in order to you know uh, get the necessary amount of votes to win. Because again, winning seems to be ultimately the only thing that that matters. No, absolutely. You're talking about. Um Hot water, which was um, Bush um, senior, Bush senior's campaign manager. He was a um, an advisor to Reagan. He was the head of the Republican Party at one point, and he has this this, this incredible quote, which I, I don't have before me, but it says something like, "You know, back in the '60s or before the '60s, you could just use the N word, N word, N word," and he actually uses it. I won't, um, and you, you know and that's fine, but now. Um, you have to be, you know, you have to use words like busing or tax cuts, and it still has the same effect. It's still going to hurt the uh, black people, but you don't have to use the N word anymore. You just um, use this coded language. And, and Reagan was, you know, was a master of this. Um, I, I think he really perfected it. After he ran, he won the uh, Republican nomination uh, for the presidency. The first place he goes to give a speech is Philadelphia, Mississippi. And Philadelphia, Mississippi is the location where 16 years earlier, three civil rights activists were brutally killed. Um, And Reagan goes there and gives a speech about state rights. And state rights is the, the rights of state to maintain Jim Crow type laws. That's what state rights always meant. So he never talked about white white supremacy. And in fact, when Carter held him accountable, he was highly offended that that someone even suggests that he was a racist. But he used the language that all author basically suggested. And and Bush Sr. did the same thing with the Willie Horton incident in where Willie Horton was a uh, was on furlough and he killed a black woman um, when he uh, when he was in prison in Massachusetts, which was Dukakis's state, who was running against Bush. And he made Halton into the vice president of Bush of um, Dukakis and, and won an election that Dukakis at the time was winning. So race has been effectively used to win elections. Um, all the way up to Trump, and, and he almost won this election uh, as a second term. Well, I take it back. He didn't win the first term. He lost that by about three million votes. Right. He won the Electoral College vote. And in fact, it hasn't been since George W. Bush, I'm sorry, not George W., um, Herbert um, uh, Bush Sr. was the last time a, a Republican won the presidency. Um, because every you know the, the other two, George W. and and Trump, won the presidency purely through the electoral college system, which, as we know, is a system designed during slaveocracy to protect the uh, power of southern slaveholders. Yeah, talk talk a little bit more about that because I do have that down in my notes, and I think that's something that not a lot of people are aware of. I think a lot of people have this uh, this perception that oh, the electoral college was was created uh, to to make sure that smaller states had equal uh, equal say and and who was ultimately elected. But there was way more at play there. So, and I know you talk about that in the book as well. Oh, well, there was. I mean, and, and I don't have my notes in front of me, but when the Electoral College is, um, is enacted um, in, in Congress, 
I mean, I'm sorry, in, in, in the Constitution, it, you have to remember that for the first, I think it was six or seven presidents, uh, with the exception of Adams, they were all Southerners. And it was based on providing representation on black uh, slaves counting as three, uh, three-fifths of a, of a human being. So the whole idea of the electoral college system was really to protect the institution of slavery. And, it, you know, in, 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 in our lifetime, we have seen two presidents lose the election by significant margins, but still win through the electoral college that privileges small states, Republican states like, say, Wyoming, for example, over some place like California. So we have this um, legacy of slaveocracy, which continues to privilege um, the minority. I mean, we really are developing an apartheid America more than anything else. Um, and, and, and that's not going to change anytime soon because those in power, um, even though you, though you have Democrats, you still need 60 Republicans in the Senate to agree to even try to change that. Um, and this is just one of those those things that keeps um, diluting the vote, specifically of communities of color. So if we did not have an electoral college, um, the last president that would have been a Republican would have been George um, uh, Bush Sr. back in 80, 88. Uh, because since then, no Republican has won um, a majority of the votes to be president, except for the second term of George W. Bush. And he only had a second term because the Electoral College gave him the first term. Wow, that's incredible. Um, one of the other things, too, I think that that's always been interesting to me that kind of ties into the the, the politics piece is this idea that there's also an economic aspect as well. And the economic aspect seems very curious to me. There there's seems to be a large uh, population of uh, the United States who would be considered maybe lower income that seem to vote for one particular party uh, and, in, in essence, vote against their own common interests, uh, specifically from an economic standpoint, because they're, they're kind of fed this lie that, that, you know, the Republican party is going to bring back, you know, these manufacturing jobs or these coal mining jobs. Um, and, and I keep looking at it like, when, when do you stop believing this lie? It's never happened. It, it's not, it hasn't happened yet. You know, they haven't followed through with any of these promises. At what point do you realize you're being conned, you know? And, and I think con is, 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 is the correct word. Um, you have a minority, like 1% of the population that control the vast majority of the wealth of this nation. Um, and with that, control many politicians to get legislation passed that continues to increase their wealth, i.e. the, um, the tax bill of uh, 2017. Um, so, so how do you maintain the, uh, the power, the, you know, the people voting for you to be, continue to be privileged? And, and the lie that is sold to so many white people is this idea that they too can one day get rich. In other words, they learn to, as my, um, the form, my former uh, dissertation chair would say, they learn to uh, dream upward and blame downwards. That is, the dream that I might one day will become part of the 1%, which of course will never happen, um, keeps me voting for laws that protects their privilege. And at the same time, the 1% keeps telling me that the reason that I am poor, the reason that I'm slipping out of middle class, is not because of them, it's because of those Mexicans crossing the border taking away your job, or those welfare queens who are taking advantage of the system um, and, and getting handouts from the government. So when we look at, for example, um, l l l let's look at um, welfare for a moment. 
The vast majority of people who get welfare in this country are white women with children. And by the way, they should get it if they are the poorest among us. But the image that we have, thanks to Reagan and the, and the idea of the welfare queen, is that it is the black people who are getting welfare. Uh, Reagan also said it irks him to see some young buck getting buying a T-bone steak with his, um, with his food stamp. And of course, he's creating for us an image of black people. But again, the vast majority of people who get food stamp and get welfare are white people. We would rather do away with that because of the impression or the thought that maybe some people of color might also be benefiting from the structures designed to help the poor. And I think it is that inherent unexamined racism that has white people voting against their best interests. We just passed a stimulus package, which is going to tremendously help everyone, especially white people, especially um, white children who live in poverty. But the idea that some Latinx children or some black children might also benefit is enough to, to create this animosity against the um, stimulus package. Somehow we have to learn to, 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 to stop listening to these lies that it is people of color who are the cause for the shrinking middle class and truly focus on that 1% who for the last 40, 50 years have just gotten so much more richer. And I'm talking about, well, back in 1973, they were probably making 40 times as much as the average employee in their, in their corporation. Now the numbers are close to 300 or 320 times. Wow. One of the things that um, you talk about also is just this idea, and this is crazy, by the way. I, I thought this was very interesting because I, I believe you said, even in the book, that you finished writing it back in, in April of 2020. And you essentially, in, in, in this particular section, you're talking about uh, violence uh, being you know, either instigated or encouraged by, by Trump and, and Trump supporters uh, based on comments he made in 2016, and you almost predict the future. Because obviously, at the time that you had written this, finished writing this book, uh, you know, the, the things that have just taken place had not happened yet. So talk about, talk about that piece of the legacy. Oh, how I wish I was so wrong. <laughs> how I wish that I misread what was happening and that January 6th did not occur. But unfortunately, January 6th should not have been a surprise to anyone. Trump and his followers and the Christian uh, right, both um, with an R and with a W, um, have been talking about instigating violence since 2016. So what happened on January 6th of this year really did not come as a surprise. Um, this has been part of the, uh, of the conversation. Um, so when I wrote this back in April of last year, before we even knew how the election was going to turn out, um, I knew that if he was going to lose, and not just me, I think it was common sense, if he was going to lose, there will be bloodshed. And unfortunately, I was right. I, like I said, I wish I was wrong. Uh, it's absolutely, it's absolutely crazy. Um, I, I know there's a, a couple things I definitely want to make sure we get to uh, today. W one of the things that you talk about is you you kind of uh, discuss the idea or, or the the phrases, I guess, religious freedom or religious liberty uh, redefined. Discuss that a little bit. I think you kind of stumped me there for a second. What did I say about religious liberty and, and, and freedom? I think just the, that the, 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 uh, the idea that, that both of those terms um, have been kind of redefined uh, to the benefit of kind of this religious right, um, you know, and oh. they've kind of changed the meanings. Um, so like when they... Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting that those who are in the process of, of, of literally curtailing the freedoms of other, rather it be voting, rather it be um, opportunities to, to, to economic um, um, uh, mobility, um, uses the word liberty and freedom, especially religious freedom, uh, as a form of gaslighting to go ahead and, and impose greater restriction on the marginalized and the disenfranchised. So, you know, and, and, and I think this has always been a political ploy. You know, for example, if I was to say, um, I don't want, for example, like in, like in Arizona, I don't want peop, uh, people reading books um, like uh, Pablo Freire's uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, uh, books that deal with structures of oppression. We're going to outlaw those books. It doesn't sound politically right uh, to say we're going to outlaw books. So instead we say we need to protect uh, the freedom and the liberties that made this country great. Therefore, we're going to eliminate books that question um, white and white supremacy. So in the name of freedom, we impose restrictions on other people. And, and we have seen this throughout our, our country's history. Um, you know, we, we're not say, we don't say that um, we want to restrict um, black people and brown people from voting because they had a major impact in the uh, 2020 election. Instead, we say we need to protect the integrity of, of, of voting. So we need to pass these legislations to limit people from voting. Um, we try to spin it as, as, as something to do with freedom. Um, so in the name of freedom, in the name of protecting democracy, on January 6th, uh, white people stormed the, the, the very cathedral of democracy uh, to prevent the counting of votes in the name of liberty and freedom and democracy. It really is messed up. I mean, I can't think of any other word for it. Yeah. Well, I could think of other words, but I won't say them in public uh, <laughs> on the program. Uh, we've probably said them before. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things I want to get to is is uh, you talk about one of the more interesting books in the Bible, the book of Revelations, and just the idea of Antichrist. And you have this whole, you have a rather long section of the book um, where, where you kind of dive into that. Uh, talk ab about what you mean by Antichrist in, in regards to, <laughs> yeah. Well, well obviously, um, conservative Christians, uh, fundamentalists, believe that there will be an Antichrist that will return, uh, that will come to earth um, before uh, the apocalypse and Armageddon. And, you know, people made millions of dollars um, in, in the um, Left Behind series detailing who this Antichrist will be. And back in the 70s, I'm old enough to remember the, la uh, the late great planet Earth that also predicted the end of the world. Now, I don't believe in an actual Antichrist arising I do believe that the book of Revelation speaks of antichrist in the plural. In every generation, individuals arise that are very contrary to the message of Jesus. So in that respect, yes, there's many antichrists. But just for fun, I'm in, in the book, I went ahead and looked at how the religious right describes this individual who will be an antichrist. And, and as I went line by line, it really described the character and the actions of uh, the former president, Donald Trump. Now, if I was a fundamentalist Christian, I would be totally afraid because, you know, talks that um, this Antichrist will arise and, and, and Christians will follow this Antichrist and they will worship this Antichrist. 
Um, and that brings to mind, like even building the, the, like the golden Donald that was just built for people to worship at the, <laughs> at the CPAC convention a few weeks ago. Um, so if I was one of these biblical literalist uh, fundamentalists, I can't think of any person in our modern time that best describes the Antichrist and best has the characteristics of the Antichrist than Donald Trump. Uh, I, I could not agree more. And, and it's funny because I never thought that uh, in my adult lifetime that I would have to uh, take a stance, you know, so, you know, vehemently uh, when it comes to, to politics. And, and it's like I, I tell my friends all the time, you know, we can we can disagree about policy and, and the right way to spend money as a country and where to, you know, and, you know, wh- which laws we should be enacting and that sort of thing. But what we can't disagree on is how we treat other human beings. And it, there doesn't seem to be much of an option in terms of which way to kind of, you know, steer at this point. And not just how we treat other p- human beings, but also on understanding and defining reality. Yes. I mean, we could disagree on political policy, but hopefully we could agree <laughs> on what is a fact yes. and what is real um, when alternative facts becomes reality. Something's basically wrong with the system. Yeah. Yeah. Alternative facts are called uh, lies. <laughs> That's just un- untruths. <laughs> That's what an alternative. Uh, I know. I know. Um, well, w- the last thing I want to ask you, uh, the, the thing I want to end on is, is literally the, uh, the subtitle of your book. So I, I, in case I didn't mention it before, uh, your new book is called Decolonizing Christianity, Becoming Badass Believers. So how does one go about be, uh, going... How does one, oh, that's hard for me to say. How does one become a badass? (laughs) (laughs) So again, remember who I'm writing the book to. I'm writing it to other communities of color. And what I'm telling them in the book is we have developed a system and where we have to go to the police department to get a permit from the police department to protest the police department for police brutality. We have domesticated protests so that we can go ahead and, and, and wave our signs and, 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 and march down the street, but nothing changes. In other words, by following the rules that have been established, those rules that have been established are designed to maintain the structures and the powers that are designed to disenfranchise us and to dispossess us. So that the only way that you could bring about change is by following Jesus and entering into the temple and overturning all the tables of the bankers and making a whip and chasing them out. So, so in a very real sense, to be badass is to stop following the rules that have been created to maintain our oppression. Now, how do we do this is very complex. It's not like every person for themselves makes their own decisions. But how, as a community, do we move ethics? I'm an ethicist, after all. How do we move ethics and ethical analysis so that we can bring about change through our actions um, that remain um, grounded on, 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 on... I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the remain grounded on some kind of virtues. Mm. Gosh, that, and that, that's not easy. Yeah, yeah. That's not easy to do. It requires um, a lot of wrestling with um, not only what's going on in society, but also how do we live into our faith? And living into that faith sometimes comes up with contradictory responses, but that's part of being a person of faith, I guess. So to be badass is to literally learn how to ethically screw with the structures that are designed to screw you. I love it. (laughs) 
I, I think there's no better line in the history of the podcast than that to end on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's beautiful. I, I learned so much uh, from this book. Uh, like I said, it's it's one of the best books I've read in a really long time. Uh, I can't recommend it enough. Uh, everyone should go out and get it. There's so much packed into this book. Uh, if you're a history person like me, there's so much history that I wasn't even aware of um, that you pack into the book. And, and you really uh, do a tremendous job of just laying out um, all of the systemic issues um, that are at play. So thank you so much, Dr. Latore, for coming on. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I really enjoy being here. Of growing old, raising a child, building a home. We would go fishing along the coast. But I got no time and I got no boat. So maybe I'll die as a pauper. No possession. No silver or copper Just you and me In the dust of apocalypse Together we lay In the sands of old cities I hope we have Christmas And a couple more dolls A big piano And a green, green lawn I hope we have Georgia Lynn and Mickey Wren and a couple good neighborhood friends. But maybe we'll die as paupers. No possessions, no sons or daughters, just you and me. In the dust of apocalypse, together we lay in the sands of old city. When I run, I'm like a ghost Empty as a breeze, quicker than most I run through the forest, underneath the pines on fire Past an old swing set and a broken rope tire Well, I don't know what time's gonna take I'm not sure what it gives away But when I hold You on the living room floor I know what I'm living for But maybe I'll die as a pauper No possessions, no silver or copper Just you and me In the dust of the apocalypse Together we lay In the sands of old cities